Good evening. My name is Marcus Nito. I work with the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, as the director of the Finance Hub. It's my privilege to welcome you all here and to have a distinguished panelist to discuss the progress on our partnership with OECD and the Tax Inspectors Without Border. Um, just a few housekeeping announcements. Keep your mobile phones on silent, um, even if you are tweeting, and do tweet. Uh, the evening will start with a few keynote speeches by our two co-hosts, followed by a panel discussions, um, and then I will open to the floor. And then we will have a, a cocktail reception, which is right there already. Um, without further ado, let me give the floor to one of our co-hosts, Ms. Angel Guria, OECD Secretary General and Co-Chair of the Tax Inspectors Without Borders Governing Board and co-host of tonight. Allow me to begin by introducing Mr. Guria, um, as having been the helm of OECD for 13 years, Mr. Guria needs little introduction. He has a distinguished career in public fine service, having previously served as both Minister of Finance and Minister of Foreign Affairs in his own country, Mexico. At the OECD, Mr. Guria has led the charge in broadening the OECD membership and spearhead efforts to position the organization as a key supporting actor in the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. Secretary General, the floor is yours. Uh, well, um, dear Achim, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be here alongside Achim Steiner, Administrator of the uh, UNDP, to welcome you to today's event celebrating this important and innovative joint initiative. The tax inspectors without borders. The result of this collaboration has been very fruitful, to say the least. But let me uh, provide you some of the insights and why has this has been the case. Now, the initiative, Tax Inspectors Without Borders, was launched in 2015 in the third International Conference on Financing for Development in Addis Ababa. Many of you were there. The initiative's practical, learning by doing, results-oriented uh, approach has quickly become a vital part of the financing for development architecture by helping to tackle tax avoidance by multinationals. It provides a crucial avenue for the mobilization of domestic resources and for the implementation of the sustainable development goals. I always remember uh, when we were in Accra, and um, uh, I think it was Trevor Manuel of South Africa who took the floor and said, how do you spell aid? And everybody was looking at him like she's saying, what, what's, what's gone into this guy, you know? So like it's a, uh, how do you spell aid? So, and before people started volunteering, he said, T-A-X. T-A-X, you know? So it took everybody by surprise. Uh, Madame Ramos, we just want to signify the fact that you were late, so there's your place is over here. <laughs> you know. Gabriela Ramos is, uh, but, uh, um, but uh, uh, the, the, this is, you know, so all, since some, some time ago, the question of domestic resource mobilization, the question of taxes has always been uh, a very uh, big issue. The, context, the, the concept of tax inspectors without borders is simple. Expert tax auditors are deployed to work with interested host administrations in developing countries and jurisdictions, work side by side with local auditors. Now, one, one example is the case of Jamaica, where tax inspectors without borders delivered eight mission tax audit assistance programs in cooperation with Germany between 2017 and 2019, eight different missions. And during this time, experts observed the significant increase in the auditor's capacity, increasing their knowledge of international tax matters and procedural skills. It is estimated that from just one of the audit cases selected for review, uh, 
an additional $4 million U.S. dollars in taxes were collected when the investment was a few thousand to make it happen. Moreover, Tax Inspectors Without Borders has been supported by the OECD's technical competence in tax matters, its network of tax experts, and the UNDP's global network of on-the-ground expertise. You are there. You, know, you are in place. You are in the trenches. And therefore, uh, the two sets of skills complement well. Now, the difference is you are in 170 countries. That means you, you have this reach, this enormous reach, and we'll see how far we want to use that in the next few, ye in the next few years. Now, over the past four years, we're talking about what has happened. Uh, tax Inspectors Without Borders delivered important results. It has provided invaluable support for more effective auditing of multinational enterprises. Now, for too long, m and have been able to use complex, possibly aggressive tax planning, taking advantage of the limited capacity in a number of developing countries' tax administrations. TIWB is helping to fill this knowledge and this capacity gap so that local auditors possess the skills and the confidence to apply international tax rules as intended. And this, of course, ensures that m and pay their fair share of taxes where their activities are carried out. Now, Tax Inspectors Without Borders program are also helping developing countries raise tax revenues, real tax revenues. To date, we're getting close to the 500 million US dollars. So now we're going to be talking about, very soon, I came about half a billion. So we changed the unit. No, We changed from m m million to the billions, you know? even if it's only half of it right now. But you know, we'll, get, we'll get to the, we'll get to the, to the units. In Africa alone, Tax Inspectors Without Borders has increased revenue collection by 310 million. So the biggest share of the pies, about 60% of the impact has been in Africa. Uh, now, this represents excellent value for money. With over 100 US dollars in additional tax revenue recovered for every dollar spent on operating costs. I mean, where else do you get this kind of Cost benefit, eh? Where else do you get cost benefit of a hundred to one? Huh? They should invest in us. Huh? Just, huh? This is would be a very good business. Actually, uh, some of you already do, and I would encourage you to continue to do that because it's it's good business. It really has a very great um, impact. Capitalizing on its success. The demand for tax inspectors without borders continues to grow around the globe. So far, there are 68 ongoing or already completed programs, 68. But 29 more programs in the pipeline for countries spanning Africa, the Asia-Pacific region, Latin America, the Caribbean, Eastern Europe. So TIWB is well on its way to achieving its target of 100 programs by 2020. In fact, it would not surprise me if we go beyond uh, 100 programs by then. The initiative has also seen growth with successful South-South programs. <coughs> I, I, I just love to tell the story about um, Botswana and Kenya. We had been working with the Kenyans, and there came a point in time where the Kenyans started feeling empowered and started feeling they, they managed the issue, and then they signed. We were in Nairobi, and they signed uh, an agreement uh, with um, with Botswana in order to pass on the um, the, the technology, let's say. Uh, so then you started having the South South. Um, now, we there was the, there was the supported the audit cases uh, that generated uh, you know several million millions in increased tax revenues. But the most important thing is it sent a very strong signal to the multinational enterprises in Botswana about the reality of transfer pricing risk. And basically, what changes 
is also the mentality. Suddenly, you got a guy there that is an expert, or, or a woman, uh, that is an expert in the field of the particular company that you're auditing, okay? Normally, they have about, you know, three or four times more auditors and more accountants and lawyers, etc., than the country. But suddenly, you know, the guy is sitting in there, is part of it, and he says, listen, you know, the picnic is over, you know, the party is over. They see what is happening and this and this and this and that, so they start checking into the financial statement and checking into, and just, and also because they've been checking outside and there's micro data that is also applicable, etc. And suddenly, not only do these guys start paying taxes, but also there's a feeling of empowerment by the local team. You know, they're so proud that they are now kind of a, on a more equal basis with, with the multinationals, which in the past had been beating them because uh, they simply had more resources. Now, uh, let, me, let me say that we're this, this Tax Inspectors Without Borders annual report um, and all-encompassing overview of the uh, efficiency and the results of the TIWB uh, initiative. Uh, you can take a look at it and you will see we're delighted uh, uh, to be launching this uh, today. Now, looking ahead, this is already well established. We're going to get to 100 programs. More will come. And also, success breeds its own success in a way. You know, we were getting... In the beginning, modest uh, support, modest vo uh, uh, voluntary contributions to support the program, and now we're getting, uh, we're getting more. So, uh, looking at the OECD and UNDP, will continue to collect more evidence of long-term sustainable impact that the TIWB has facilitated. Now, including the effects of investment climate, organizational effectiveness, tax morale, taxpayer compliance, you get a little bit more sophisticated. You start looking at other aspects of the problem. Moreover, we'll continue to collaborate with the international community and focus on promoting further partnership. In fact, we're delighted to note an increase in the active participation by partner administrations. We've already seen 16 countries deploy their expert tax officials, and the UNDP managed TIWB roster, there's a, a roster of the experts, now includes more than 50 tax audit experts. But we're not stopping there. We have more ambitions and exciting opportunities for growth. This includes support for tax crime investigations, common reporting standards, data interpretation, very important, tax treaty negotiations, uh, moving forward, TIWB will prioritize cementing partnerships with regional tax organizations and expanding its scope by piloting tax criminal investigation programs. And last but not least, TIWB is also an excellent complement to ongoing international tax reform efforts. It underpins a base erosion and profit shifting actions, a BEPS, um, through the inclusive framework. The inclusive framework has now 134 members that are participating. So practically anybody who is, anybody in terms of uh, financial centers, et cetera, are participating. So um, they represent um, this, this, the, the inclusive <coughs> framework, currently 134 members, and the OECD Forum on Tax Administration which has uh, its own 50 leading tax administrators from around the world. So Tax Inspectors Without Borders is a critical tool to fight profit shifting because as our global revenue statistics indicate, developing countries are more adversely impacted by BEPs due to their heavy reliance on corporate income tax, mostly developing countries are about corporate income tax, much less on the uh, personal taxes and less on the VAT. On average, developing countries uh, 
corporate income tax constitutes about 16% of the tax revenues, and it's only 9% in OECD countries. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, the international community is at its best when we join forces, when we work together. And Tax Inspectors Without Borders is a paragon in this respect. By working hand in hand, the OECD and the UNDP have greatly contributed to domestic resource mobilization across the world. We can further strengthen our collaboration by ensuring the alignment and impact of resources in support of the SDGs. We look forward to hearing from the esteemed panel about their experiences with TIWB as an effective capacity development tool for domestic resource mobilization. And remember, how do you spell aid? It's T-A-X, as Trevor Manuel would say. So, Achim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Let me call the second co-host of the night, um, Mr. Achim Steiner, the Administrator of the United States Development Program and Vice Chair of the UN Sustainable Development Group with over nearly three decades of international development work, climate resilience, international cooperation. <laughs> and, um, and since joining UNDP as an administrator in 2017, Mr. Steiner has been leading the organization effort in implementing and achieving the 2030 Agenda while in championing sustainability, economic growth, and equality for the vulnerable. The administrator, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carlos, and you don't believe a word of what you've just read, but it's very nice for you to say so anyway. <laughs> Good evening, Angel, ministers, ladies and gentlemen. For 13 years, <laughs> No, no, that's a typing error. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been in my job for two years, so I claim still to be very much following um, my dear friend and colleague, Angel. And frankly speaking, there's not much else I should add to what Angel has just said to you, because one, this program is one that you were very much part of, not only <coughs> helping to bring alive, it builds also on something that so often in the work that you do with the OECD is to, with your analysis, open the eyes of countries and, and governments and public policymakers to things that are simply out of sync. And you refer to the Addis Ababa agenda. One of the facts is that tax revenue is still the principal source of public mm -hmm. finance, not the exclusive one, but certainly the principal one. And the average or median rate of taxation from industrialized countries is around 26%. In many developing countries, it barely reaches 15%. So here is a simple illustration of why, as we look at financing of you know, the 2030 Agenda, financing SDGs, national development, climate transitions, clearly the ability of um, government to raise revenue and raise it in a way that is integral to also an equitable fiscal policy. Because let's remember, it's not just about how do we maximize the state's ability to take money from its citizens, but how do we develop in the context of a fiscal policy and a national development policy the kinds of revenue streams that allow government to be at least a catalytic player in the investments we are talking about? So Tax Inspectors Without Borders is um, one of these, and I was saying this to, to Villa just now, one of those things that you, you begin out of an idea, and before you know it, it has become probably one of the best investments in ODA in terms of a rate of return on investment. I mean, we always say that. Uh, you and I, when we, we stand up, but so far we haven't been challenged by anyone else. So we will maintain yeah. that for the investments that those of you made when you enabled us to do this, um, we claim that this is probably something that if we were to go to the stock market, we would do very well. <laughs> but I want to also emphasize it depends a lot on partnership. First of all, OECD and, and UNDP finding a way to, in a sense, optimize their respective strengths. Secondly, finding tax inspectors who are willing to be part of this idea and, and you know, invest their time, but also countries willing to say, look, let's try this out, because very often you're dealing with very complex tax issues here, and it's not just a matter of sending somebody in for a week and you know, doing a bit of work. Some of these audits go on for a year, a year and a half. They are real searching uh, attempts to prove to multinational enterprises that the era where basically government was not able to keep up with the capacity that a company had is kind of coming to an end. And actually, companies, frankly speaking, prefer it as well. It creates transparency, it creates predictability, 
and far less of a chance of one day being hauled in front of either a national court or the court of public opinion. Let me also say that um, in doing this kind of work, I want to pay credit to those who were willing to accompany, accompany us on this journey. Uh, and it was interesting reading my notes here because I was going back to the history and uh, there's an interesting characterization. Finland financed apparently uh, UNDP's part of this work and you have uh, a basket of donors, which makes you a basket case and us a very <laughs> privileged partner. <laughs> it's very rare that I can say that. I'm <laughs> um, um, a very privileged partner with Finland at the time having really taken a kind of bet. Yeah. And I often you know, speak to my key partners in the donor community. I say to them, I wish you would rediscover some of your sense of um, experimentation and being a venture catalyst also, because too much of our development finance today is essentially driven by risk minimization, avoiding anything that could possibly create waves. And yet, some of the best ideas in development have always come out of doing something that was never done before. And I certainly, in UNDP, am trying very much to make the organization an organization that actually believes in its value in the future of development and not simply dealing with legacies of development. This is so important because countries don't need to be told what their problems are. They know what their problems are. What they're looking for is new ideas, new frontiers, new solutions, new partnerships, and sometimes it's as beautiful as finding somebody who most of us would have in our lives at home considered not the most friendly neighbor becomes a major asset, the tax inspector. And we start bringing them together with partners in the countries we work with, and suddenly we have an extraordinary partnership. I also want to recognize Norway, which recently joined um, in this partnership. And I know, Angel, you have in OECD a, a whole basket of donors because they fund an entire tax component of OECD's work. So here is also a great example of how we have come, come together in, I think, hopefully making these investments not only valuable. I just wish we could carry the story of Tax Inspectors Without Borders back to some of your capitals also, whether in the countries that are part of the program or in the countries that bought into it as financiers, because this is a very good story, and it's a shame that more people don't hear about it. In that spirit, thank you very much for being here this evening. We have a wonderful panel. I don't want to stand in the way of that. So thank you, and thank you, Angel, as always. Thank you. Thank you very much, Administrator. Um, we have a little video, a short video to show of uh, a case of TIWB program in Senegal, where the TIWB ordered support by the French government over 2014 and 15 period generated 18 million US dollars in additional tax revenues. So. La plupart de nos États en Afrique bénéficient de l'aide au développement, mais l'aide au développement est en train d'être réduite au fil du temps. Deuxièmement, l'aide au développement ne peut pas être la source de financement des projets phares de l'État. Il faut absolument qu'on commence à réfléchir sur les financements domestiques de ces questions qui sont capitales pour les États. L'amélioration de la fiscalité sera à l'avenir une priorité clé. Nous devons nous assurer que les pays disposent des bons outils et des compétences pour mobiliser les recettes nécessaires au financement du développement. Le Sénégal a mis sous l'égide du président Macky Sall un plan, dénommé Plan Sénégal émergent. Maintenant, le Sénégal étant un pays où la population jeune est majoritaire, effectivement, aujourd'hui, les défis que nous avons sont les défis de tout pays en voie de développement, c'est-à-dire d'avoir une croissance forte, inclusive, qui permet de générer le maximum d'emplois, de revenus pour nos concitoyens. En six ans, le budget du Sénégal a presque doublé et donc, naturellement, les recettes ont également augmenté. Le Sénégal est en train de d'aller vers une amélioration des ressources internes. C'est vrai que le Sénégal n'en est pas encore là, mais on est sur la voie. Il y a énormément de moyens de mobiliser des ressources domestiques, mais il y a des sources de financement qui sont plus larges que les autres, et ça, c'est vraiment la source de taxation au niveau des multinationales. Et lutter contre la fraude fiscale, ou contre une optimisation trop agressive de la part de ces multinationales, c'est faire quelque chose de bien pour la solidarité internationale. La France, comme d'autres pays, à travers l'OCDE bien sûr, 
euh, doit travailler à aider euh, ces pays à mieux lutter contre la fraude fiscale. Lancé en 2015 par l'Organisation de coopération et de développement économique et le Programme des Nations Unies pour le Développement, l'initiative Inspecteur des impôts sans frontières envoie des vérificateurs chevronnés dans les pays en développement. Ils travaillent main dans la main avec les agents locaux du fisc sur des contrôles complexes d'entreprises multinationales. L'objectif Accroître les recettes fiscales qui sont essentielles au financement des services publics. 13 programmes ont permis de collecter plus de 400 millions de dollars. Chaque dollar dépensé dans un programme a généré plus de 100 dollars de recettes fiscales additionnelles. Actuellement, 35 programmes sont en cours, dont certains sont menés en partenariat avec des organisations fiscales régionales, comme le Forum sur l'administration fiscale africaine ou le Centre interaméricain des administrations fiscales. 25 programmes sont sur le point d'être lancés. D'ici 2020, 100 programmes sont prévus. C'est un exemple concret de ce que la coopération internationale peut produire en termes d'augmentation des recettes fiscales, de renforcement des compétences et de la confiance parmi les agents locaux. Cela permet aussi d'envoyer un message fort au monde d'affaires. Chacun doit payer sa juste part d'impôt partout où sont menées leurs activités et où ils obtiennent leurs bénéfices. Pour ce qui concerne la collecte des impôts, le Sénégal a connu des bons assez conséquents depuis la grande réforme de 2012. Les recettes sont passées effectivement de 800 milliards en 2013 à 1 200 milliards en 2017, ce qui correspond à une évolution relative de 50%. Les multinationales constituent un maillon très très important du moins dans le dispositif fiscal. Nous avons constaté un ensemble de stratégies mises en place par les entreprises pour se soustraire au maximum au paiement de l'impôt. Le combat aujourd'hui que nous menons avec nos vérificateurs, avec nos inspecteurs et nos contrôleurs, c'est d'assurer la lutte contre les prix de transfert et la lutte contre les management fees qui font remonter énormément de ressources qui échappent de ce fait à l'impôt. Vous savez, avec inspecteurs des impôts sans frontières, nous recevons des experts internationaux qui nous permettent, depuis la programmation, de faire les bons choix sur les dossiers et leur expertise nous permet de, de, de mieux encadrer nos, notre contrôle. La mission, c'est de partager avec les collègues sénégalais ici mon vécu, mon expérience personnelle et les pratiques professionnelles. On découvre des choses ensemble, notamment des schémas d'optimisation fiscale très agressifs, qui sont des pratiques dommageables pour, on va dire, l'État sénégalais. Tous les pays, en effet, sont confrontés à ces mêmes défis. Simplement, il y a des techniques, pratiques qui peuvent être partagées. Je dois dire qu'avec la découverte du pétrole, le Sénégal se retrouve dans une contexture nouvelle, puisqu'il nous faut de, un nouveau type d'inspecteur des impôts capable de prendre en charge la fiscalité de ce pétrole et la fiscalité des multinationales. Le programme inspecteur des impôts sans frontières nous apporte une touche nouvelle dans la fiscalisation des opérations internationales. En tout cas, nous avons bon espoir que les dossiers actuellement en cours vont avoir des retombées financières immédiates, mais surtout pour le futur, à amener les contribuables à changer de comportement. Et c'est là le plus grand défi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll start now with um, a first um, short four minutes intervention from the panelists, and then we'll you know, have a second round where I will ask you some questions. Let me start with um, um, Your Excellency, Ms. Kitty van der Heid. I hope, sorry to no, mispronounce your name, Vice Minister for International Cooperation. Um, from the Netherlands. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you, and no worries about my name. I think I can do without this, right? Oh, no, we're going to do it. Because we have a party next door, so. 
It, it is working, okay. Um, so I'm Kitty van der Heide. I am representing Sigrid Ka, who is also in the governing board of Tax Inspectors Without Borders. And just to underline how incredibly important we find this program. We have been a supporter right from the start, from day one. Um, and I mean, everything that's been said, everything we see basically already spoke for it. I mean, where do you find a program with a multiplier of one to a hundred? I've been working in development cooperation for 30 plus years. I can't name one at all, right? So this just shows you that it has a huge multiplier. I think what we don't haven't heard yet, but what is incredibly important for us is that this allows countries to spend their own money. They're no longer dependent on aid. They're no longer dependent on all kinds of conditionalities. This is truly a sovereign way of raising money needed for health, for education, for essential infrastructure. So we've been involved from the beginning. When this was signed up in Addis, we sent staff to Paris to think through how we would deliver a program in the field. We've had senior tax auditors work in Ghana and Rwanda. And now suddenly we're, you know, four years and half a billion dollars later. So I don't know if there are any other donors in the room, but can you just check out chapter three? Results in 2018 and 19, and you'll see more than $300 million raised in Africa. That's what Africa can do for Africa with just a little help from us. Um, I'm also very happy that we're moving beyond tax audits. Uh, as Angel was mentioning, that we will start looking at criminal investigation. I think that's a critical need. I think there's much money to be had, so the multiplier might actually be going up from one to 100 to one to God knows how much more. Um, I've read the report, and I know that it's very difficult to find senior tax auditors to go to these difficult places to do the hands-on job. Uh, what I can tell you is that we will continue supporting this program with our tax auditors, uh, but I'm also very happy to hear that we are starting a South-South cooperation program with was India, China, no, India, Mexico, and Morocco, and I think that's incredibly important. Um, now, I have a disclosure to make here. I am an international fiscal economist. This is the first meeting I am in that I'm comfortable saying that. <laughs> um, so no wonder that I'm a very strong supporter of this program. Um, and it, I have to say with incredible regret that I'm gonna have to step off the podium. We have the king and the queen here and my duty now needs to be somewhere else. I wish I could be here. My fiscal heart is ticking. Um, but I'm going to leave you with something that I truly believe in. And when I studied, this was my guiding motive. Taxation is the price which civilized countries pay for the opportunity of remaining civilized. And if we take that and we think of the SDGs, then this is, I think, the best way forward for developing countries to finance their own development rather than being funded through others. So chapeau to OECD, chapeau to UNDP, keep it up, keep it going, and we'll be there alongside with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And whenever you need to, we really understand. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, let me give the floor to Your Excellency, Mr. Vili Skinari, Minister for Development Cooperation and Foreign Trade of Finland since 2012. Prior to joining full-time politics, Mr. Skinari has worked in various positions in the field of international trade. Finland, as the administration has meant, has been the biggest donor of TIWB operations through UNDP, and we are very thankful for that. The floor is yours, Minister. Thank you, and um, regards to the king and the queen. I've lived in the Netherlands, so I can, I can truly say that. Um, th thanks for the invitation, and thank you for your kind words. And regards from Finland, and regards from the new government. We have just been working for 100, 100 days. <coughs> As you said, I'm also not just mi Minister of Development, I'm also the Minister of Trade. And, and that's why I'm also interested to hear when you, when you said the word business taxation and business, it sounds, sounds pretty good. 
But all in all, we really appreciate the cooperation with, uh, with UNDP, with OECD. And as said earlier on, we really much appreciate also the results and the expertise, what we have mutually provided. Um, I come from the country which, well, let's be honest, we pay high taxes, we appreciate the uh, welfare state, welfare society, and in my last panel in, in this country, in the US, let's say that it was just after the uh, election of Trump administration, we didn't have that mutual understanding about taxation as a whole, but now I'm very happy to have this kind of mutual panel here. But all in all, strengthening tax collection in developing countries is among the uh, priorities of Finnish government's development policy. Um, our national experience shows that taxation can be a central element and elements in building an economically, socially and uh, environmentally sustainable society. So that's something I want to emphasize, that's something I want to underline today here as well. Um, and also as a government we are very proud to be associated with TIW, TIWB and I can also say that we have been a donor and we will be a donor for the upcoming two years. Let's say that we're talking about at least something like 1 million euro uh, investment for this. Also, as said, we are also equally interested in, uh, in all efforts that we could, we could do together, how we can mutually develop taxation as a whole, how we can see the digital opportunities, and how we can raise productivity at the same time when it comes to, to our mutual interest, and how we can broaden the tax base. That's, that's a very good question. It's also a question in Finland, but it's also a question in, in developing countries. But with these words, uh, once again, thank you for the cooperation. And as I said, our government is ready to support um, TIWB, but also we are ready to provide our experts, our expertise, and um, I think I can mutually share this feeling with my, my colleagues from Europe and elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Let me give the floor to Your Excellency, Mr. Augusto Flomo, Deputy Minister of Finance and Development Planning from Liberia, which has been in this post since 2018. His position covers managing the aid portfolio debt, domestic and external macroeconomic and financial policies of the government of Liberia. Liberia completed a highly successful tax audit program in 2018, supported by TIWB jointly with the Open Society Initiative for West Africa, focused on the extractive sector, and is currently implementing a South-South cooperation program with Nigeria, focused on the manufacturing sector. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, let me join my other colleagues to say thanks to the organizers uh, and for also inviting us to share with you on great successes that I think we are counting in Liberia as a result of this program. Uh, for us as a country that went through the civil crisis, you will, you will understand that we needed such a program even more than many other countries. Uh, during the crisis, we lost a lot of our professionals. Either they came to the diaspora, or they were killed by the civil crisis. And so capacity gap you know, became very huge in terms of professionals who understand issues of uh, taxation and others. And so uh, during the presidency of Madame Salif, just about the time her tenure was closing up, then this, uh, the program came true. You will see that uh, during the time of uh, when we introduced the LRA, which is the Liberia Revenue Authority, we still had a lot of uh, issues with uh, our tax system in terms of understanding uh, just the 
fundamentals or the basic uh, issues around audits of multinational enterprises or institutions. And so when the program came, a, for us became an eye opener that there's so much that could be done, especially that for us as a country, we rely uh, on the extractive industry as, the, uh, as our major source of revenue. And then, of, of course, in the agriculture sector where we also rely on rubber. Without the appropriate skills to be able to conduct fair assessments uh, in these industries, then you, you, you will certainly know that uh, you will keep having a lot of problems in uh, raising the appropriate taxes. So the skills transfer, the knowledge transfer to <coughs> us as a country became very useful because of the hands-on approach, which I think a, a number of our colleagues have mentioned. The approach has enabled us now, as we speak, to, in your absence, carry out a number of audits that we are doing all by ourselves because the team that worked with the professionals that were in country for the period that they were there had the interest in acquiring the kind of skills and knowledge in supporting us. So currently, as we speak, we are having, uh, we now have uh, two audits completed in the mining sector that we've done by ourselves. Uh, we've done two audits now uh, in the telecommunication and in, in insurance industry. We now have eight audits in the agricultural sector that we've just started. So that's for us speaks volume and, and, and if, if you also look at the numbers that, that we, are, we are counting, we, we are running the figures of around 60 million just from you know, these exercises you know, of making sure that we are fairly assessing and appropriately engaging the leadership of those institutions you know, to make sure that uh, we, we get a fair share of what the government needs to get. It is even more critical for us now because of the fact that uh, we've, uh, as a new government, we took, uh, this leadership took over 2018. And with the economic uh, turn, turn down of you know, a lot of our commodities, especially the iron ore and rubber sector, and then we had the oil mill drawdown because oil mill prices in Liberia was a huge support to the, to the economy. Uh, on mill uh, you know, drawdown, and then we had a Ebola crisis that came in in 2014, which also hit us very hard. Uh, most donors did uh, uh, front load during the Ebola time, support to the government. Uh, currently, we are having a downturn in terms of uh, volume of support in terms of aid. So the fallback we have is to, to look at our taxes to be sure that uh, we, have, we are fairly benefiting from what we have as, as a government and as a country, and that uh, fair assessments are being done, and that uh, institutions are, are fairly contributing their portion of, of, the, of the share. So I think the exercise, I, I would say, uh, as it's being designed, is, is worth continuing and supporting in a huge way to to provide a lot more, lot more skills to developing countries uh, like ours. Uh, now, yes, we are, we are making progress with South-South uh, relations. We now have signed an MOU with uh, Nigeria, hoping that uh, that MOU will get operationalized very soon so that we begin to increase the volume of our engagement across uh, various sectors and especially now that we have our domestic revenue strategy, which we have developed as a new you know, administration to, to broaden our tax base. So this becomes very important for us. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you, Excellence. Uh, great story. Maybe we should count to those extra audits as well. <laughs> um, let me give the floor to Your Excellence, Mr. Gilberto Barros, Deputy Minister of Finance, Cabo Verde. Um, you've been in this post since uh, January 2018. Prior to that, um, the minister was a senior advisor to the Minister of Finance and had several functions at the World Bank, providing both technical and financial advice to governments, regional organizations, and leading the World Bank group dialogue with private sector institutions and organizations. A TIWB program is soon to start in Cabo Verde with a focus on profit shifting on tourism and financial sector, and allow me to say, a palavra sua in Portuguese também. Uh, good afternoon. Um, f first of all, uh, allow me to start by uh, thanking uh, OECD and uh, UNDP for hosting this event. Uh, it's important to, to share experiences across uh, countries. And um, in the case of uh, those uh, small, beautiful islands in uh, 600 kilometers away from, from West Africa, for us, it, it is indeed uh, critical that we increase uh, domestic uh, resources. Because without that, really, uh, we will essentially delay development and we will essentially delay improving the quality of life of our, our citizen. So it's sort of a matter whereby um, we, we have a choice. It's something that we simply must do. Um, and it's something that actually we've, we've been doing in, in, in Cape Verde and over the last uh, five years, um, tax collection has consistently uh, increased as uh, we hear nice music from, from South Africa. <laughs> my, my, my good colleague there will, will, will enjoy and will jo we'll join the party later on. Um, so um, it's consistently uh, increased as a percentage of, of GDP uh, and it, it, it's at about 30%, but um, our ambition is, is uh, simply higher. Our ambition is higher because, as um, the Prime Minister of our country will, um, will state uh, later on uh, this, this week, our ambition is not to remain a middle-income country, but to become a developed country. And um, to, to do that, we, we need to really uh, increase uh, our ability to, to collect tax revenue, and to do so, it is critical to, to look at, one, uh, our staff, uh, because without human capacity, all of this is, is nice, but uh, it, it simply won't, won't happen. Um, we also need to look at the systems so that they, they, they're more, more, more efficient, and indeed, we make it easier for taxpayers to actually pay taxes. We make it more efficient, less time consuming. Uh, that also improve the investment climate. Uh, my World Bank bias will come through there. Um, so we also need to communicate better with taxpayers. We are in the age of everything now, thanks to social network. So public scrutiny is extremely high, and that's, that's good. Therefore, we must communicate clearly with taxpayers in letting them know exactly what it is that we are doing with their taxes so that they can indeed understand the relevance of paying their taxes, short of which they keep gaming the, 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 the system. One more thing that I think it's, it's important because here we have you know, the international community is, is, is sitting here. Um, we need to keep strengthening information sharing mechanism, including through the Global Forum on, on Transparency and Exchange of Information on, on, on Taxes. These are important uh, initiatives, and uh, we, we need to, uh, to, to keep going, going on with, with, with that. Um, in Cape Verde, one of the things that we need to, to do is improving our tax uh, services ability to, to look at sector specific because it becomes sophisticated to the point that you indeed need to understand the sector as well, uh, including 
the, the, the tourism sector, and this is where this, the next uh, technical assistance we'll be getting will be, will be useful. Now, there are some, some challenges. Um, we're a small island of 500,000 people. Um, and yes, indeed, uh, most of those taxpayers are people that I, that I know. <laughs> <laughs> so trust me, I'll, I'll be getting less, be, less Christmas cards. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's part of a game. And um, I think it's w when you spoke earlier, uh, you were mentioning um, that, that reform comes, comes somewhat with, with noise. And uh, if we want to do relevant reforms, we have to accept that they come with noise. If we're not willing to do that, um, as policymaker, we're in the wrong game. And uh, the gentleman who let me know that was uh, Madiba. And he told me, if you want to be a leader, you have to have courage. If you don't have courage, that's not your game. So you have to have courage, and you have to make reforms. And doing tax reform also in it by itself is not sufficient. We have to go beyond that. In our country, our belief is <clears throat> we have to have a private sector-led growth, and we have to focus government spending on public goods and addressing market failure. The rest, we should find a way to get the private sector to drive that growth. They do it much better than the public sector. So, and we are misusing and misallocating scarce resources. Moreover, we need to make sure that taxpayers' money, and that's why we need to speak to them, are used efficiently and effectively. So we have to have mechanism to ensure that indeed our investment project, and my director of planning is here, um, are really going to the most relevant project. Otherwise, it's not good enough to collect the taxes. The money has to be well invested. So w one, one, one last comment is that um, as policymaker, this is not always easy yeah? uh, when dealing with uh, multinational. Um, one, um, one size doesn't, doesn't fit all. Um, and I'll be specific about it. W when you look at attracting um, tourism investment in Cape Verde, which are, which are coming big, but um, 15 years ago, we were, not, we were not known. So we had to forego more. But today, I have sat down with my colleague from tourism and transportation and told him, we have to change the game because we can. All the big brands are there. Hilton is there, Radisson is there, Melia is there, Rio is there, um, Marriott is coming. Um, and even within Cape Verde, I'm not sure my colleague from tourism will accept if I say also it's one size fits all. Depending on the island, depending on where the island stands in terms of development, it makes more sense to say, you want to go there? Good luck. You're going to make money. And you know it, and I know it, so good luck. Please proceed. We're not going to stand in your way. Now, if you go into an island called Mayo, where I don't have even a, one, a, f a single four-star hotel, then you've got my attention. Let's, let's engage, right? So to, to, to wrap it up, because time, time, time is also scarce, um, th th thank, you, thank you very much. And we shouldn't look at tax collection in isolation, but always in a, in, in a, in a, in a bigger picture. But it is an absolute critical element to making the life of our citizens better. And again, thank you for, for your initiative. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Let me give the floor to Mr. Arvin Gadgil, Policy Director for International Development Policy, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Norway. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. The first thing I'm going to do is apologize for next door, because that's us.
Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, but it's to cele is, is it celebrating taxes? Isn't uh, it? Uh, well, um, you, but you're more than welcome to join us um, after this. I'm sure it'll go on for a little while. Well, my, the, my first task, or my second task then, is to say uh, thank you to um, our key partner, UNDP and OECD, on this project. Because, uh, Minister, you were, you were, you were on, on spot when you were talking about courage. Uh, it's been a courageous uh, endeavor, this. And it must be really gratifying at this stage to be able to pat yourselves on the back and say, we did it. It actually worked. Regardless of all the doubts that came about in 2015, I remember those conversations, they were not all uh, flattering for, for the initiative. And, uh, but but uh, you did it. And I just want to you know, quickly uh, underline that the job is nevertheless not done. Because now we are also uh, supporting UNDP on Tax Inspectors Without Borders as well as OECD. And, and what we are going to look for now is an even better uh, way of working together between the two organizations where you utilize your, uh, your comparative advantages. The OECD's unrivaled ability to convene experts and, uh, and uh, the most brilliant minds uh, on tax in this world. And the UNDP's unrivaled legitimacy in the countries they work. It is a dream team, but you have to make this dream team work even better. And uh, you make sure that you use each other's strengths and, and, and make uh, you know, decisions and planning in concert. Um, and I've also, you know, just to, as if, I know we're running out of time, to just mention just one comment on Achim Steiner's point about, about you know, why isn't this more sexy? Uh, <laughs> lack of a better word. And it is actually something to think about. I mean, um, yes, uh, um, I mean, I, I, can, uh, I can understand why blended finance is, is very attractive. But when you look at the numbers, there's no reason why there should be 25 events on blended finance and two on tax. I mean, it, it's not... It's not a rational approach, and this we see in development policy over and over again. It's not a rational approach to development policy uh, to run after what looks most popular. Uh, but congratulations to everyone in the room. We haven't done that. We run after what's perhaps least popular. Uh, although I have to say it's, it's fascinating that in Norway, when you ask people in Norway, which public service are you the most satisfied with, they say the taxman. I mean, it, it's, it, it's quite surprising, but it's, it, it's, uh, it's true. But, uh, but the fact that there is some more momentum on this is, uh, is important, and I want to congratulate the uh, Tax Inspectors Without Borders for actually putting this event into this setting, and please continue doing that, because it's important that we, that we, um, that we <laughs> allow more people to be blessed by this message. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe we, next time we get Norway to organize a tax discussion with the music and they will get more sexy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give the floor to Ms. Gladys Gartet, head of United Nations Systems Union, Minister of Finance from Ghana. The floor is yours, madam. Hi, okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator, and thank you for the organize. Thank you to the organizers for inviting Ghana to be part of all this important discussion. Domestic resource mobilization has been on agenda since the adoption of the Agenda 2030. But I must say that even in Ghana, even before the adoption of the Quadruple A, the Addis Ababa Action Agenda we have already upped our game when it comes to domestic resource mobilization. So you realize that our engagement with the tax inspectors with our borders started actually before 2015. That tells you that we were already thinking ahead as a country and knowing that um, the, the, the honors to develop our country depended on us, how we can make enough money to undertake developmental projects. When you talk about raising domestic resource mobilization, there are basically four ways of doing that. You are either widening the tax net, you are deepening the tax net, 
you are making your tax administration more efficient and effective. And there are two ways of doing that. Blocking all the loopholes, making sure that all the monies that are supposed to come to the government kitty actually end up there. And then you are also reducing expenditures in relation to collecting the taxes. And uh, I must say that it is in line with that that we welcomed the TIWB initiative to Ghana because this whole idea of tax capacity building, especially in the field of the audits, to ensure that both before and after the monies that are due the government for people who have earned income in Ghana are actually paid into, into the government chest. The Ghana Revenue Authority was established in 2009. And so when we started our engagement with the tax inspe inspectors with our borders, it was, uh, the GRE was a very young institution struggling to put together all the three agencies, formerly the Customs Department, the Internal Revenue Service, and then the Value Added Tax, which are three institutions that have been put together under one management one board of directors. And uh, Ghana actually welcomes the capacity building that our friends from the TIWB helped uh, the Ghana Revenue Authority to put them in a very sound footing. So the capacity issue, we can actually attribute it to our friends there. And then we also had a lot of interaction with our friends when it came to the area of the extractive industry, especially the mining sector. We had just been lucky, found oil, knowing very little to do in that area. What are the issues to look for? How are we even going to measure the oil that is coming out? What are the percentages, even in the, in the investment that should go into that? And we welcomed our friends very well because we worked together. And I'm a, I must say that it was not um, a master-student relationship. It was a hand-holding. This is the information we are getting that it was a hand-holding experience. So capacities were built, and uh, the selective audit, the capacity strengthening of all the audit institutions, that should go to make sure that the oil that we're extracting, the mining industry, the gold, all the bauxite and everything. So we were getting the revenues that we have. One question has always come up. Yes, we can say that um, as a middle-income country, our revenues have been increasing systematically. I must say that we have not done a detailed research work to know the attribution effect of how much of uh, our engagement with the, the TIWB has actually contributed to the increases. But definitely, once capacity has been built and capacity has been left, we know that whatever gains that as a country we have chalked in this area might have come about as a result of our relationship. And we have not finished that. Coming talking about the South South Corporation, Ghana has twinned up with South Africa in the South South Corporation arrangement. And we are working on this strongly to ensure that the value addition that we all require when it comes to domestic resource mobilization and the extractive industry and government, I mean, efficiency in tax administration in general, they are actually achieved. I think these are the opening introductory remarks that I would want to give. And Ghana appreciates all the work that we have done together with our friends from TIWB. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Thank you very much. Um, I thank you very much for your introductions and open remarks. Um, I know the minister Skinari has to leave soon. So I mean, let, me, let me give you one last question for you before you leave, and then we go with a little questions to the other panelists. What elements of the TIWB are attractive to you as a donor that took the risk that, that you know, Mr. Steiner mentioned when it wasn't that popular at that time? What are the, the main attraction as a donor for this? Well, first, I have to say that, as you know, Finland and Norway sometimes compete, at least in certain sports, but at least they seem to have better parties as, <laughs> as we have. We still have to work throughout the evening. Um, I think one 
point I would like to mention is, is the importance of building up the economy as a whole from this kind of informal economy to more formal economy. This is maybe the, the, the big picture I would like to raise and the importance of that kind of uh, development. Um, but obviously, for Finland, you asked that what kind of uh, what kind of things we appreciate in the first place. I think for us, that how we how we saw how we saw the uh, potential and the partnership, and ov obviously the, the the partnership what you have done together already, I initially. Um, I think all in all, the results, as already mentioned here. For Finland, we saw that yes, this really works, and we really saw that it's so efficient. And uh, I think it's it's also an issue that we discussed with our Nordic friends and with our European friends that we really appreciate it. Um, but obviously, many questions still remain that that how TIWB plans to tackle, for instance the questions related to informal economy. That's maybe my w one question, uh, since this is maybe the biggest challenge uh, as far as taxation in developing countries. Um, and sustainability as a whole, how, how we see that picture. Um, but all in all, I think that once we meet, hopefully next year we can, we can get back to these concrete questions and concrete action points. And um, as said, taxation as a whole, as you mentioned, these are very good examples, what we heard from Kana, from elsewhere, from your countries, that yes, there is progress and there are results. And especially the improvement of tax base is so important that, that how, we, how, we see the, how we see the situation in Lover and lower middle income countries, which are typically too much dependent on VAT and other consumption taxes, uh, which are proportionally heavier for women and for poor people. And, and that's why, for instance, when Finland's strategy as a whole is to emphasize on women, emphasize on girls, emphasize on gender equality, and it all comes together, actually, to our cooperation. But I'm sorry, I need to go. I, I need to work also as a Minister of Trade and try to make some money in the <laughs> evening. So uh, I do apologize, but thank you very much. And thank you for my, my colleagues as well. Thank you and, uh, and see you tomorrow, see you later. So thank you. You're excellent, thank you very much. We, are, we, are, we appreciate your time with us. We'll, we'll go for a few more questions here. And then I think we can uh, have some of this cocktail with that music from the outside. We don't need to have our own music. Um, Your Excellency, Mr. F uh, uh, Deputy Minister Flomo, we, you talk about you're doing so much of those audits now in so many different sectors on your own. Now, what is the reaction of the business community in, in, um, in Liberia? with all this new movement of audits, um, are they, I'm not sure if they are going to be, how are they dealing? Are they happy that they see the value? And I'm gonna take a seat here. Well, two things. Thanks. Um, so yes, there, there are some business businesses that, that feel that uh, uh, they're being fairly judged or fairly evaluated or fairly assessed. And what this, this is doing is that it is setting the stage for a reduction of corruption. Because once you have fair evaluation and then you are given the appropriate bills and the payments are legitimate payments, is kind you know kind of reduces the pressure of individual you know co-mingling whatever their intentions could be so yes there are some businesses that feel that is good there are other businesses that feel that we are harassing them and so it's a mix it's a mix those who feel that we are harassing them feel that uh, <laughs> 
feel that they, you know, they should be given a lot more uh, time to, 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 because our, our tax law is such that uh, it's self-declaration. You know, so whatever you, you declare and say, this is what I think, or this is what I have made, and therefore this is what I should pay, according to our law, is acceptable. But in order to, so, so some of the businesses have honored declared before. And so with these engagements, you know, those who have been honored declaring, certainly you will know that uh, they won't like the kind of exercises because then it allows them to pay the fair value of what has been assessed. So it's, it's, mixed, it's mixed. For those who don't want to be bothered with, uh, you know, practices that will impede their function or their activities, well, they embrace it. But it's, I, I mean, someone say here that reforms come with, uh, with hard decisions. It comes with challenges. It comes with uh, its own issues around it. But the fact that it's giving, is 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 bringing results, and results that are even much needed for the country, then there's more beneficial then everyone has to you know, kind of work around it. But I think gradually those who have some mixed feelings will eventually uh, you know, appreciate the fact that we are doing a good job. Thank you. Um, Deputy Minister Barros, you mentioned the tourism sector and we're gonna start working with you. Tourism, what do you think are the major challenges you face in Cabo Verde from the tourism sector, and how can we help? Thank you. Um, um, I think we, this is on now. Um, really, the, the, the big challenges, it's one, um, I will call it uh, knowledge uh, asymmetry between the multinational and the tax uh, authority. You have, you have to understand the, the industry so that you can do proper audits. Otherwise, it's not too complicated for a sophisticated company to, 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 to trick you. Um, the, the second thing is, um, you know, in this world of uh, the internet and uh, purchasing services in one country while it's being delivered elsewhere, the, all the Airbnb, and it, it's really uh, challenging for us to, to collect uh, value-added taxes on, on, on these uh, services. It's just really, really something really quite, quite difficult on some, something on which we will appreciate any assistance. But also there's um, the other issue of payment of management fees which we're not always sure that um, some of these costs that are not inflated. So these are some of the, the, the challenges that we, we're facing and that uh, we'll appreciate uh, any, any support in trying to pin it down and, and working, working with you on that one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Arvin, you, you mentioned the need to do more, and, and, and we heard you, and, and, and we're delighted that to have you all with us now. But from, from, from Norway point of view, from where you sit, what lessons can, can others take from TIWB uh, when it comes down to the so domestic resource mobilization? Sorry, what? What, uh, what lessons? Lessons, right. Can, can the broader community take from a project like TIWB if you are trying to do domestic resource mobilization? Well, I think in general, this is, uh, this is modern development cooperation. Uh, we, uh, you know, I don't know, it's, a, it's a, a smaller group here now, so we can maybe even talk even more, more honestly and directly. Is it, there's a running frustration for those who have been in, in, you know, on the development policy side of, of, uh, of this for a while. It is that our development aid budgets are supposed to reflect the bad things in the world. So if there's a lot of people without, a lot of kids without education, we put you know, the same type of proportion of money away from in the budget for education. If there's lack of health, we put a little bit you know, aside for health. 
while we com often completely miss the point that development policy money is targeted political money and money that you can do things that you cannot do with other types of money. And one of those types of things is this knowledge transfer or knowledge exchange that there is very little incentive in the market to create, there's very little incentive in, the, in philanthropy to create, and it's only through the development policy budget that you can do that. So um, what lessons there are to learn? I mean, there's basically, the, it's the payoff lesson that it is, and it, if we're looking for catalytic aid, which is the gospel of the Addis uh, agenda, I mean, you don't need to look any further. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, we, we are taking the consequences of this in, 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 a, in, a, in a small way, at least. I mean, we are building something called a knowledge bank in the, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and NORAD, where we, where we also acknowledge that it's not in only enough to have, you know, tax experts being sent out from Norway or, or through Tax Inspectors Without Borders. You need sector speciality experts. Because, and ideally join the two. So for example, we will, you know, in, in the case of Ghana, for example, we work with, with Ghana on the oil sector, um, on, uh, on the management of the oil revenue. Um, and we would do that, you know, both tax inspectors and, you know, the oil bureaucrat experts and, co and combine the, you know, these sets of knowledges to, to, to deliver, um, a, you know, a much better suited package. So, I mean, there, there are a lot of lessons to be learned, but I think that the first lesson is, that, you know, the, the development policy community need to wake up and understand that development aid cannot be the way it's been uh, for 30 years. It needs to, you know, everyone needs to understand that we need to seek real catalytic effects and knowledge transfer and exchange is, uh, has proven to be that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Gatti. Khan is very committed to the Sustainable Development Goals. I have worked a little bit on those issues in Ghana in the past. How does a program like the IWB support the overall development agenda of Ghana? You know, is it just a bad, there's no more money now, or is that there's some other elements that come out of a project like that vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, an SDG agenda? Th thank you very much. Um, the good thing about Ghana's developmental effort is that we don't have a separate development agenda and then an SDG agenda. I kept saying that when we adopted the SDGs and we went back home, we had an existing development framework that we were implementing. So the question we asked ourselves was that, must we stop implementing the agenda we're holding and then develop a new one. But the government at that time decided that let's look at what we have in store. And so we went around the country to look at the tenants of the then existing development framework vis-a-vis -vis the tenants of the 2030 agenda. And then to our surprise, we realized that Ghana was already 70% compliant with the SDGs, even with our old development agenda. So we decided to finish that development framework implementation. And then we developed a new one with a new government to make sure that now the 30% gap was actually filled. So I want to put it on record that in Ghana, the SDGs have been aligned completely. So anything or any effort that is bringing in uh, an enhanced revenue domestically is actually going to support our development framework from day one, which is all encompassing the SDGs. So the TIWIB initiative is very good. But the problem we have, a little challenge that we have is that the just inspectors without borders is more of curative rather than prevention. And in my country, we say that prevention is better than cure. Must we sit down for the offenses or for the gaps to be developed and then our friends come and help us or we, are build, we build our capacities to find out. Or is there a way that even with the initiative we'll be able to stop these leakages from the multinationals even before they happen? Is there a way we can get our friends to ensure that the OEC, we, the, the TIWB is being championed by UNDP and OECD? 
Most of the multinationals are also from the developed economies. Is there a way we can have them to pay the taxes that they are supposed to pay? And if they don't pay in our countries, is there a way they can be sanctioned in their countries? Do we have anything like that? For now, no. So then, we're going to have the issues come up again. And you know, multinationals are big. If they come to Ghana, they are coercing us, a little bit of arm twisting, and we do not agree. They go to country B to go and set up. And for the politician, even two employment created is good for them. So this race to the bottom, uh, when it comes to enticing, uh, imagine economies with tax incentives and tax realization. And that. Is there a way we can look at it? So that at the end of the day, we are talking about domestic resource mobilization as the prime resources for a country to develop. If all the multinationals working in developing economies are paying the right taxes, and they are supported by their inner, uh, by back countries, home countries, to pay those taxes. I'm sure we will have very little to complain when it comes to domestic resource mobilization. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to propose a little bit different on what my notes as a moderator were. Rather than hoping for questions, I'm actually propose that we go, have a wine, have a, a drink. And we're a small group and actually dialogue among ourselves a little bit with more informal, more beverage. But before all that, I want you to please you know, give a, a round of applause to our panelists. <laughs> you know, on behalf of UNDP and the OECD, I want to thank you for being here, for your time, um, and to say that we are with you and your governments um, to try to support you in achieving the necessary resources to achieve the SDGs. Um, and it's a pleasure to support you all in that sense. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everybody. But don't go before a conversation and some uh, hors d'oeuvres and, and drinks. Thank you very much. <laughs>